this video is going to cover chapter 5, section 5. So the first thing that we started with today was the indirect proof. Uh, the warm-up just went over the conditional form of the sentence. So this is the if-then, the contrapositive, um, and a conjecture or a counter example. So we'll kind of revisit that again when we talk about the um, indirect proofs. So an indirect proof is basically a proof in which you assume that what you're trying to prove is wrong and you contradict that by providing an example of which would make that false. So if you could think about like if you've ever argued with a friend or had a conversation in which they thought they were right, you knew they were wrong and you were like, okay, let's assume that you are right. So, you know, here's the way that we would say that it wouldn't be wrong. So if somebody said four quarters don't make a dollar and you were like, okay, I know that four quarters do make a dollar, but let's assume four quarters don't make a dollar. And then you know that there's four of them, 25 cents a piece, that's a dollar. So you're basically proving your statement by first contradicting it and then providing a counter example. So the example um, that Miss Glick went over today in class was this one on the bottom, okay? I, that you're trying to prove the indirect proof that a right triangle cannot have an obtuse angle. So the first thing you wanna do is identify what you're trying to prove. You're trying to prove that a right triangle doesn't have an obtuse angle, but then you wanna assume the opposite. So the first thing you're gonna do with your assumption is state the opposite, which would that, would if it says it cannot have an obtuse angle, the word cannot is what you would change to be its opposite, and you would be saying that a right triangle can have an obtuse angle. That's your assumption, and that's the first thing that you do to work with an indirect proof. And then step three is kind of go through there and actually state, okay, if it can have an obtuse angle, that means that one of the angles would be 90 because it's a right triangle, and the remaining part of those angles, the other two angles, would have to sum up to be 90, which means individually they have to be less than 90. So you worked to prove that it cannot have an obtuse angle. So again, indirect proof at the top here says you're going to start by identifying the conjecture. So what are you trying to prove? And then assume that the opposite of the conclusion is true. Use direct reasoning to show that the assumption leads to a contradiction. So basically prove that opposite to be wrong and conclude that the assumption is false, making the original conjecture true. Then we talked about the order of the angles and the sides and how they compare to each other. So the theorems here just say that the positions of the longest and shortest sides of the triangle are related to the positions of the largest and smallest angles. For five dash five dot dash one, it just basically says that if two triangles, two, two, sorry, two sides of a triangle are not congruent, then the larger angle is opposite the longer side. So if I had looked at a triangle, like let's say the one that's there, and it says AB is bigger than BC, for example, let's say AB is 10 and BC is eight, then I know the angle opposite the larger one, opposite being across from, which means angle C, would be larger than the one opposite the smaller one. So A is opposite eight, which makes A less than C. And then five dash five dash two says the actual, the converse of that. If two angles of a triangle are not congruent, then the longer side is opposite the larger angle. So now we're saying based on these angles, like angle Z, let's say that's 100, and angle Y, let's say that's 50, that the side opposite angle Z, which would be XY, is larger than the side opposite the 50, which is YZ. So larger side is opposite larger angle, larger angle is opposite larger side. We're gonna skip this proof and go to the next one. So this example says, write the angles in order from smallest to largest. I'm gonna zoom in on this picture. So if I look at this triangle, I have my triangle, one side is 28.5, one is 33.4, and one is 27.2. So if I wanna put them in order from smallest to largest, then I'm gonna look for the angle that is opposite the smallest side. Smallest side here is 27.2, so that makes the smallest angle, angle H. The middle length side is 28.5, which makes this angle opposite or angle J the next in order from least to greatest. And then the last one, the largest side, which is 33.4 is opposite G, 
which would be the largest angle. So from smallest to largest, it would be angle H, angle J, and angle G. Example B says write the sides in order from shortest to longest. So now we're working in the opposite direction. This time we're given the angles and we want the sides. This triangle has two of the three angles of my triangle. Measurement's already there, so I know they add up to 180. I'm going to do 54 plus 39, and I get 93, 180 minus 93, and I get 87. So I know that this angle here is 87 degrees. So now I'm putting them in order from shortest to longest. Shortest would be opposite the smallest angle. Smallest angle is 39. Shortest side would be KM. Next in order of size angles would be 54, which is opposite LM. So LM would be the next. And the last one, which is the largest, is 87, and it's opposite KL, so KL is the largest side. Okay, 2A here says write the angles in order from smallest to largest. Sides are listed, so smallest would be opposite the 9, which is angle B. Next would be opposite the 15, which is angle A. Next would be opposite the 19.5, which is angle C. 2B, write the sides in order from shortest to longest. I have two of the three angle measurements, 22. This is 90, which means that 22 plus the missing angle there would have to add up to 90. So 22, and I get 68 degrees. So in order from shortest to longest, opposite the smallest angle, which is here, would be EF. The middle measurement would be here at E, so that makes DF the next. And the largest, which is that 90 degrees, is opposite DE. So in order from shortest to longest would be EF, then DF, then DE. Okay, the last topic in this section is um, the triangle side inequality. So this says a triangle is formed by three segments, but not every set of three segments can form a triangle. So the rule is that every two sides, the sum of any two sides of a triangle must be greater than the third side. So if I look at this triangle, I've got 4, 4, and 7. So 4 plus 7 is 11. That's bigger than 4. Same thing would happen on this side. And 4 plus 4 is 8, which is bigger than 7. This forms a triangle. On the second triangle, I've got 3, 3, and 7. 3 and 7, obviously bigger than 3. 3 and 7 the other way, obviously bigger than 3. But 3 and 3 would be 6. 6 is not greater than 7. So it can't even equal it. It has to be greater than it. So example 3A says, tell whether a triangle can have the sides with a given length, 3, 5, and 7. So what it's doing here is taking the time to put them all in pairs. If I add 3 and 5, I get 8, which is greater than 7. That works. If I add 3 and 7, I get 10, which is bigger than 5. And if I add 5 and 7, I get 12, which is bigger than 3. Because all three of those work. This, is a tri this can form a triangle. For the next one for B, it says 4, 6.5, and 11. So if I start by adding 4 and 6.5, I get 10.5. That is not greater than 11. So this cannot form a triangle. If any one of the three pairs doesn't work, it doesn't work. And you don't even have to worry about continuing with the other two. C says n plus 5, n squared, and 2n. So it's scary because it has variables, but then it says n equals 3. So if I take that 3 and I just plug them in here, then I'm dealing with 3 plus 5, which is 8, 3 squared, which is 9, and then 2 times 3, which is 6. So my real lengths are actually 8, 9, and 6. So if I compare these, 8 plus 9 would be 17. That's greater than 6. 
8 plus 6, 14. That's greater than 9. And 9 and 6 are 15. 15 is greater than 8. So this is yes. It can form a triangle. If we look at the 3A, B, C, 3A, if I add 8 and 13, that's 21. That equals it. So this is no. 8 plus 13 is not greater than 21. 6.2 plus 7 is 13.2. That's greater than 9. 7 plus 9 is 16. That's greater than 6.2. And 6.2 plus 9, so this one's greater than 9. If we want to show the work here, 6.2 plus 9 is greater than 7 because 15.2 is greater than 7. And the last two, 7 plus 9 greater than 9, or sorry, 7 plus 9 greater than 6.2. 16 is greater than 6.2 because all three of those work. This is a yes. And then 3C is just like the example above with the variables. It gives you variables, but it also gives you what the value of T equals. So if T minus 2 is 4 minus 2, then that's 2. 4 times T would be 16. And 4 squared plus 1 would be 16 plus 1, which is 17. So do them in groups. 2 plus 16 is 18, which is greater than 17. 16 plus 17 is 23, which is greater than 2. And 17 plus 2 is 19, which is greater than 16. So this is also a yes. And the last part of this page is finding the side lengths. So if it's asking you to find the possible length of the third side by giving you two different sides, then what you're actually doing is finding the range of possible lengths for the third side. So this is the length of the two sides of a triangle are six centimeters and 11 centimeters. Find the range. And so with a range, we're looking for an inequality. We're looking for greater than something, but less than something. So a compound inequality. So if it says 6 and 11, then I can say the side that I don't know plus 6 has to be greater than 11. The side that I don't know plus 11 has to be greater than 6. And 6 plus 11 has to be greater than the side that I don't know. So they're using S here as your variable. And I can solve each of these inequalities. So if I solve S plus 6 equals or is greater than 11, then I get S is greater than 5. S plus 11 is greater than 6. I get S is greater than negative 5. And 6 plus 11 is greater than S. 17 is greater than S. Since I'm not talking about positive or negative numbers because we're talking about the sides of a triangle, I can rule out my greater than negative 5, which means I'm saying that S has to be greater than 5 but less than 17. My compound inequality goes smallest to largest, and the S is in between. So this is read as S has to be greater than 5 but less than 15. A great shortcut here is that S has to be greater than the difference between the two numbers but less than the sum. So if I go back to 6 and 11, the difference between those two numbers is 11 minus 6, which is 5. S has to be greater than that but less than the sum. 6 plus 11 is 17. And for number four, it says the lengths of two sides of a triangle are 22 inches and 17. So I've got 22 and 17. Find the range of possible lengths. So the difference between 22 and 17 is 5. It has to be greater than 5. And the sum of 22 and 17 is 39. It has to be less than 39. That wraps up what was covered in class today. Uh, so good luck with, this would be 5.5. .5.